Consider a flow of water being directed through a flanged joint as shown in the figure below. The velocity of the fluid at the joint inlet is 4.25 feet per second, and a static pressure gauge next to the inlet indicates a fluid gauge pressure of 2.28 psi of gauge pressure. The joint redirects the fluid by 30 degrees and decreases the diameter of the water pipe from 12.5 inches to 6.25 inches. Determine the horizontal force in the flanged joint and be sure to indicate direction, that is tension or compression. Okay, so we have an X component of momentum because we are looking for this force in the X direction. That Fx value is again going to be confusing because I'm throwing out Fsx and Fbx and Fx here is just a name like anything else. So I'm going to call it something. Let's call it F. So F is the placeholder name for that force in the left direction. And I will describe my x-axis as going to the right. So it is positive in the right-hand direction. Next, I can consider the assumptions that I'm going to be making, and since we are a little bit more practiced at this, we can probably get further out in our assumptions before we start. I will start by recognizing that I have steady state operation of incompressible flow. And I'm going to neglect any body forces in the x-direction because remember the only body force that we care about for our purposes is gravitational acceleration. I mean, I guess there could be other types of acceleration if we were analyzing, I don't know, the box of a pickup truck being used as a pool by putting a tarp in the back of the pickup truck and filling it with full of water, having people sit back there and we wanted to try to figure out the forces acting as the truck took tight cookies in a parking lot and exerted some acceleration in the outward direction. I mean, those are all things that we could consider. But gravitational acceleration is the only body force for the scope of this class. Anything else we want to assume? Well, I was told the velocity of the fluid at the joint inlet, and I'm going to be determining a velocity at the outlet, and let's just say that those are average velocities doesn't give us enough information to be able to describe a velocity profile here, so we would have to assume something anyway, and if we're going to be making an assumption about that velocity profile, we might as well assume that the average velocity is 4.25 feet per second, and that's what is given. So I'm treating state 1 and state 2 as having uniform flow. Which again, just is saying that the velocity doesn't change with respect to area. So the velocity at the top, is the same as the velocity in the middle, which is the same as the velocity at the bottom, etc. Uniform flow at 1 and 2. Okay, I think that's enough to get started on our x momentum equation. First question I will ask do we have any surface forces? And yes, we do. We have a force acting on the surface in the form of the forces acting on this joint. So like, you can basically think of this like, imagine this is bolted together. Each of these pipes has a flange on the end of it, and there's some sort of fastener connecting these together. So what the problem is saying is determine how much force is required to hold that joint in place. Does that make sense? So that force, F, that we are solving for is going to be the force at that joint. So at the flange, how much force is required either in the left direction or the right direction? Okay. So I'm going to write a surface force in the form of F, and that is to the left. I define my x-axis as being positive to the right. That means I write minus F. And F is just a placeholder. You can use epsilon, you can use Brian, you can use whatever you like. Next question. Do I have any other surface forces? Yes, I do. I do because at state 2, the pressure of the fluid is atmospheric pressure. But at state 1, the pressure of the fluid is going to be higher than atmospheric pressure. That means that there's going to be a net force in the right direction as a result of the pressure. 
that pressure is acting on the control volume because the gauge pressure at state one is higher than zero. In the previous problems that we had analyzed, we'd always had the same pressures at the inlet and outlet. So there was no difference in pressure driving any sort of force. But in this problem, we do. We have an unbalanced pressure, which is going to result in a force acting on our control volume. And I will account for that force as being in the right direction, specifically in the positive x direction, because the pressure is acting on the control volume. So it's acting like this. So the force exerted by the pressure at state one is going to be to the right. So I will leave it as a positive quantity over here. So my surface forces are negative F plus P1A1, because that's how I account for the force exerted by a fluid in terms of its pressure and area. Those are my surface forces. My body forces I have already neglected. And then I have steady state operations. So this entire term disappears. And I am left with the integral across each of the control surfaces that cross the boundary in the x direction. I have two state points that cross the boundary in the x direction. That's at least, at least up here in the x direction. It's not as though state 2 doesn't count because it's not perfectly in the x direction. There's an x component of velocity at state 2 and there's a y component of velocity at state 2. So I have an integral at state 1 and an integral at state 2. I'm splitting this control surface integral across each of the state points. So it's row one times u1 times velocity vector one times dA one. That would be the wrong place to whip the one. And then plus integral at state two, let's draw that better, of row two, u2, velocity vector two, dA two. Okay. I have uniform flow at states one and two, which means that I can collapse that vector into a magnitude. Row one and u one are both constants, so they come out of the integral, and I'm left with row one times u one times average velocity at state one times a one. And then do I add a negative sign or not? Is that a positive quantity or a negative quantity? You're right, it's a negative quantity because the velocity in the area vectors are in opposite directions. The area vector is always out, meaning it's to the left here. And our velocity vector at state one is to the right, which is opposite of a one, therefore they collapse into a negative magnitude. Now, same logic at state two, we have row two times u two times the average velocity at state two times a two. And do I add a negative sign there? No, I do not. I don't because the velocity vector and the area vector are both in the same direction. They are both appearing to the right, or more accurately, in the upper right direction, but from the perspective of the x-axis, they both appear to the right. Okay. Then I recognize that state 1 has a velocity that is only in the x-direction, so the average velocity at state 1 and the x-component of velocity at state 1 are both the same thing. So I will write this as negative rho, because I've assumed incompressible flow, row one and row two are the same, times average velocity at state one squared times a one. And then we are adding to that rho times, now I need to try to write my x component of velocity at state two in terms of the average velocity at state two. I was told that I have an angular offset here of 30 degrees, which means the average velocity at state two is in this direction then the x component of velocity is going to be v bar 2 times cosine of 30 degrees. And I didn't actually mean to write cosine of 30 degrees here. My brain was focused on what I was about to say as opposed to what I was trying to write. So the cosine of 30 degrees describes u2 over v bar 2, which means that I can write u2 as v bar 2 times cosine of 30 degrees. So I'm taking rho times v bar 2 times cosine of 30 degrees times v bar 2 times a2, which I can write instead as rho times cosine of 30 degrees times v bar 2 squared times a2. And this is negative f plus e1 times a1. 
Next, let's run an inventory of what we know. We have water that is incompressible, and we are assuming standard temperature and pressure, which I will write as an assumption. Water at. Maybe I'll do a cool at symbol like I did last time. At STP, therefore, the density of water is going to come from table A1 or A3. And if I were to pull that up, table A1, you can see that water at standard temperature and pressure is going to have a density in imperial units of 1.937 slugs per cubic foot. 1.937. Slugs per cubic foot. So we know density. We know P1. We know P1 is a gauge pressure, by the way, and so we are plugging in the gauge pressure at state 1. If we were to use absolute pressure, we would have to account for the fact that P2 is also acting on the control surface. So either you can work the problem in absolute pressure, at which point you would have a P1A1 term and a P2A2 term, or you can just work the, the problem in gauge pressure, at which point you just have P1A1, because the gauge pressure at state 2 is 0. Does that make sense? Ultimately, all we only care about is the pressure difference between the two, because that's what's exerting the net force. Anyway, at state 1, we also know the diameter. So we can calculate A1. And at state 2, we know the diameter as well, so we can calculate A2. We were told the average velocity at state 1, so we know V bar 1, and we are looking for F. So we have one equation and two unknowns right now. If we had some other way of relating what was happening, I could describe V2 in terms of what I know and then calculate V2 or plug it in symbolically. But do I have a way of referring to the velocity at state 2 in terms of other stuff that I know. Is there some other tool that I can deploy that would help me out here? You're right, there is. I have the conservation of mass. So we could start with our Reynolds transport theorem and say 0 is equal to ddt of the integral of the control volume density with respect to volume plus the integral across the control surfaces of density times velocity vector times area vector. We recognize that entire second term, middle term, is going to become zero because it's steady state. Therefore, I'm saying zero is equal to the integral of state one's density times velocity vector integrated with respect to area plus the integral across state two's density times vector, velocity vector with respect to area. And the densities are going to come out because it's incompressible flow. So I'm going to be left with the integral of velocity vector one with respect to a one plus the integral of velocity vector two with respect to a two. I'm saying that that's equal to zero, and then I'm collapsing that integral by writing those vectors in terms of a magnitude because I have uniform flow, at which point I'm going to have V1, A1, and then I'm going to ask you, is it a positive or a negative quantity? And you're going to say, it's negative, John, because they're in opposite directions, and I'm going to say, well done. So you're going to say zero is equal to negative V1, A1, plus, and then we have V2, A2, written, term, written in terms of uniform flow, and then I will ask, is that positive or negative? And you'll say, positive, because they are in the same direction, and I will say, excellent, excelsior. So we have 0 is equal to negative average velocity 1, A1, plus average velocity 2, A2, which is another way of saying average velocity 1 times A1 is equal to average velocity 2 times A2. Does that make sense? So we're saying the mass flow rate at state 1 is the same as the mass flow rate at state 2. The densities cancel, so I have volumetric flow rate at state 1 is equal to the volumetric flow rate at state 2, which means that I can write V bar 1, A1 is equal to v bar 2 a2 so v bar 2 is equal to v bar 1 times the proportion a1 over a2 and you guys know how i like plugging in everything symbolically as far as possible before i get into calculating numbers so i'm going to plug that in over here and v bar 2 then would be v bar 1 squared times the proportion a1 over a2 quantity squared times a2 Let's just run all that together. We have negative f plus plus e1 times a1 is equal to negative rho times v bar 1 squared times a1 plus 
rho times cosine of 30 degrees times v bar 1 squared times a1 squared divided by a2 squared times a2. Therefore, I have rho times cosine of 30 degrees times v bar 1 squared times a1 squared over a2. Is that all making sense? Excellent. Glad to hear it. Okay. At that point, I know everything in that equation except for f, so I will solve for f. And then I will simplify a little bit by factoring out where I can. I could leave P1 A1 and then write density times V bar 1 squared times A1 times the quantity 1 plus cosine of 30 degrees times A1 over A2. Okay. P1 was described as being 2.28 PSIG. And then we are multiplying by A1, which is going to be pi over 4 times D1, the diameter at state 1, which is 12.5 inches squared. And we are looking for an answer in pounds of force, which means I need each of these terms that I'm adding together to be in pounds of force. Luckily for us, a PSI is a pound of force per square inch. So taking 2.28 PSI multiplied by a quantity in square inches is going to give us pounds of force. Yay. Then we are adding to that the density of water at standard temperature and pressure, which is 1.937. slugs per cubic foot multiplied by the average velocity of state one which was 4.25 feet per second and i square that i'm just going to double check that it's 4.25 because all of a sudden i had a concern that i was reading that wrong squared 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 Multiplied by A1, which is pi over 4, times diameter 1, which was 12 and a half inches. He said, hoping he was right. Yeah, it appears to be. Then we are multiplying that by 1 plus cosine of 30 degrees times the proportion of A1 over A2. And that would be pi over 4 times diameter at state 1, which was. 12.5 inches squared divided by pi over 4 times 6.25 squared inches squared. It is 6.25, right? Yeah. Inches squared cancels inches squared, and pi over 4 cancels pi over 4. So I'm really taking 1 plus cosine of 30 degrees times the quantity 12.5 over 6.25 squared. So that would be 2 squared, which is 4. So I have 1 plus 4 times the cosine of 30 degrees. Everything inside of that parentheses is unitless, so I just have to keep track of the units out front. And I'm beginning to run out of space, so I will scoot everything to the left here. Yeah, take the parentheses with me, that's what I want. And I want pounds of force, so I will start at a pound of force and work backwards. I can describe a pound of force as one slug times one feet per second squared. Let's see how far that gets us. Slugs cancels slugs. 
and second squared cancels second squared. Then I have feet, 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 feet in the denominator, and feet squared and an inches squared in the numerator, which means I need 12 inches in one feet. Square everything. That's not a square. Then I square everything, and inches squared cancels inches squared. And then I have feet, 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 and feet, 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 feet. leaving me with pounds of force. So I have everything I need to compute an answer, except for the help of my calculator, which we can quickly remedy. Now it looks like I can't zoom down far enough to, for you guys to see that. So I'm just gonna grab 2.28 times the quantity pi over four, and I'll let it scroll back down. Pi over four times 12.5 squared. And then we are adding to that 1.937 times 4.25 squared times the quantity pi over 4 times 12.5 squared again times 1 over 12 squared. I will write as 1 over quantity 12 squared. Then we are multiplying by one plus the cosine of 30 degrees. My calculator is already in degrees. Then I'm multiplying that by 12.5 squared over 6.25 squared. I know I could just multiply by four, but I don't trust my mental math as a general rule. And we get a syntax error, as is tradition. So we get rid of one of our parentheses and we get 412. 0.901. Well, let's just run through that again. We had 2.28 times pi over 4 times 12.5 squared plus 1.937 times 4.25 squared times pi over 4 times 12.5 squared times 1 over 12 squared times the quantity 1 plus the cosine of 30 degrees times 12.5 squared over 6.25 squared. Cool beans. And that's higher than I was expecting. So I must have gotten a sign wrong. I'm going to guess it happened here in this step because I was trying to keep track of the signs, which is as I was solving for f in one fluid motion. And as you guys know, I don't trust my mental algebra. There it is. Aha. Uh -huh. She was right here. Okay. So when we solved for f, we brought this over to the right hand side. So it was negative P1A1 minus rho V1 squared times A1 plus density times cosine of 30 degrees times V bar 1 squared times A1 squared over A2. And then I negated everything, but I forgot to switch this to a negative. 400 pounds of force is a lot in that little joint. So I apologize for any confusion. Okay, so let me try that again. Calculator, if you would please switch that positive to a negative. And we get a much more reasonable 176.5 pounds of force. Then the problem asked for a description of direction. That is, is the joint in tension or compression? For that, let's consider the fact that we are solving for a reaction force. That's how much force is required to keep the joint in place. So the force required to hold the joint in place is going to be to the left. That means that the joint is going to be in tension. Does that make sense? So the joint naturally wants to fall apart, meaning in order for us to hold it together, we have to provide a force in the left direction of 176 pounds of force. Therefore, this is intention. 